Hello and uh, welcome to MMS Sessions number two. Uh, I'm very pleased to announce that we have the amazing Dennis Jones with us here today. A uh, bit of a Manchester legend. Uh, he'll be doing some live stuff for us, uh, performance-wise, talking through all the setup here and potentially some live performance going on as well. Uh, it's a bit of a freestyle thing. We'll see how it goes anyway. Um, but yeah, you know, if you came to the first one, obviously with Ben Pierce. Um, earlier in the, in the year you'll kind of know what, what, what we're about just sort of exploring different musical topics tonight uh, how you know how to perform a lot electronic music live uh, but without the use of a laptop as you can see um, so yeah I'll, uh, I'll hand it over to Dennis thanks very much for tuning in if you're online or for the folks here thanks very much okay I'm just going to begin by playing something so you've got an idea about what I'm doing there's two different variations something that's kind of more acoustic a little bit more kind of song based and then the more electronic stuff so you'll see the range of stuff that I'm kind of operating with and then we'll kind of we'll unravel it in a bit so
Let's go to one side of the other I'll bet to your bed to win and I'll turn you down Live set that I work into the set. This is one of the earliest ones, so you can see the sort of the the progression. Actually, hopefully. <laughs>
Thank you. You can hear me okay, can't you? So yeah, that's that's me basically. This is my setup. This is an element that I kind of want to sort of unravel a little bit with you guys. Basically, this is a routing of a desk. There's numerous ways to do it. I've just happened upon it this way. I've got numerous bits of bits of equipment. Not all of it's with me now. Um, this happens to be what I can actually move around with me in one go. So. I'm Dennis. I've been making music since I was about eight. Started with the guitar, and at every stage when I got bored of the guitar, when I listened to new music, I wanted to make different sounds, so I kind of wanted to add to my setup. Maybe in 2001, I was listening to mostly electronic music heavily. 16 years old, I was going to clubs, very much the same as you guys, I'm sure. So wanting to kind of translate that sonic experience into what I was producing musically, the realisation was that I couldn't do this with the guitar, so I had to get some extra bits of equipment. Uh, first one was the DD5, which was this delay, and it allowed me to give a minimal loop, so a 1.5 second loop, which allowed me to create a bedrock for a track and then add and improvise and practice stuff over the top of that. And that got me into the idea of arranging tracks outside of just writing songs, so thinking about percussion and layers and harmony and all of the extra bits and bobs. So that then led to a sampler and led to various other bits and bobs. So this is where I've ended up. Um, and this is the live setup. So don't be fooled by this. I don't produce music at home on this all of the time. I have a laptop. I choose to do this live because I'm restricting myself dramatically. Um, the drum machines, I'll let you have a look at the equipment. I'll talk you through each, each item, but it's generally quite affordable equipment. Uh, it has to be transportable. Um, and it's limited, you know, uh, with software you've got endless capacity, you know, you can make a drum or a kick drum sound like anything you want it to, but I've got these two drum machines, I can't alter the kick drum, I can just place it. So that's one restriction, I've got two of them, there's only so many steps that I can use, I can't do flams and various other bits and bobs, so there's, there's a restriction there. And that's the essence of my live performance, I'm restricting myself to force a creative response. Um, and that's kind of what I'm going to try and demonstrate to you and sort of show that there's an approach to that. Um, it's not necessarily throwaway, but I mean, if you sharpen up the way you can improvise, your response to any idea will be quicker. And I think this setup, having loops and being able to put an idea down, rest on it for a moment and then move on to the next one really quickly is actually really healthy in the pro production of music because it teaches you not to be too precious of what you're producing. Because in reality, everybody has their own opinion. And there's no right or wrong. So don't forget that, you know, it's totally and endlessly subjective. So my personal taste in music is never going to relate to everybody's. So it's the same with producing music. So um, this is basically my tool, my instrument. Um, and within here, I've got two drum machines, two synthesizers, two sets of effects, which I can alter so I can have different effects on those and 12 channels in the desk, and I can choose whatever goes into there. So at the moment, I've got guitar, vocal mic, both of the drum machines. Um, there's an extra cable there. 
which could be for anything else. So if there's a synthesizer there, you know, you plug the synth in, you can sync everything up via MIDI and you can have that as one of your sound sources. You know, I've got some homemade synthesizers or no noise generators, anything that makes a noise, you know. That's also one something, one something that I want to demonstrate. I mean, I've got all of these noise generators, but what I also like to do is use found sound so you can sample the table, you know, you can use drum hits from anywhere, you know, and it's that ideology that led me to this setup. So I don't, I'm going to reference some of the people that inspired me. So people like Matthew Herbert, people like Jamie Liddell, I don't know whether I'm saying these names and it's lost on people, but they were initially the first people that I saw sampling live. So they'd have an old Akai um, sampler and they'd build up the loop on, the, on stage. This was as a result, I was so inspired by this because I was seeing laptop DJs, laptop producers and I was let down by this, you know, I realised the technicality and the production techniques that are involved. But to go to a live performance, I feel like you need to have a human there. And one of the essences of humans is that we make mistakes and we do things spontaneously. And I think you're restricted somewhat with the software. You can preordain things and you can have effect sense. But what I've learned and what I've experienced, and generally through making mistakes live, is that people are drawn in by the mistakes. So as soon as you fuck up, people want you to do it well. So they pull a little closer and they support you a little bit more. And I've done this numerous times. Like a prime example, it was good that it happened actually. You know, just a slip of the foot and everything's gone. It's like a stack of cards. You know, one little mistake and it's all gone. It's not the end of the world actually. What I find is when that happens, people actually want you to repeat the track. And the fact is with this setup, it's never the same twice. So it's a really clear demonstration that what you're presenting will never be repeated. And I don't know whether it's live music that you're interested in, but essentially, if you're making music, there's going to have to be a point where it's played live. Whether it's, you know, producers DJing and playing records, they're always looking to try and do an additional bit just to make it unique live, to make a, a remix or something, or a white label that, that they play live. You need a distinction. And I think this has become my distinction in a way to define myself instead of everybody else. So... Yeah, that's basically my setup. I want some questions now just for you to ask about this setup. What do you want to know just from what you heard there? Because I'm interested to see what people use production wise, what music they're into, because essentially you can produce anything you want with these bits of equipment. So I don't know, I'll just go along the front here. What You're all producing on MIDI equipment, I presume, but can you simplify your style of music? I know it's a tricky thing to do, I can't necessarily do that, but one person by person. Uh, I don't know, I've not really thought. Um, what are you into? Do you know what I mean? More electronic music, so, cool. uh, but I mean, I've been into everything, so with rock music, I've yeah, been yeah, massively yeah. into that. Um, so basically, like integrating different styles of music, what what do you find is like the best sort of ways of doing that, if you know what I mean? So obviously, if you are inter interested in your different genres, how can you... Well, I see it as an together. osmosis thing. It's, I mean, it's like you, because it's a response, everything for me is a reaction to the previous thing that I've generated. So if I'm collaborating with somebody, we'll go into this in a little bit, actually. I've done numerous collaborations with people, but I'll only work with an idea if it sparks an idea in myself. So if I sit on a track and if it doesn't get me within 30 seconds, there's no po point working on it. You know, you need to have that spark. You need to think that you can add something to it. So if there's a gap in there and you think there's a melody that I can hear, it's in my ear, so I've got to put it down, then work on it. And I feel that I expose myself or try to expose myself to as much music as possible. You know, so I'm absorbing all of the di these different styles. I'm listening to different types. I'm fascinated by every type of music, really, within reason. Of course, I've got my idiosyncrasies and the things that I like that other people don't. But I think what will happen over time is if you give yourself enough equipment to generate the tones and realise where the noises come from, you can recreate anything you want. So it will find its way into your music. So if you're making techno and you're into rock music, it's inevitable that you'll find an electric guitar and you'll use that somewhere. So that will be the way it finds its way into the music. I think you can be a bit too conceited with music. You can decide that it has to be this thing, it, w it has to be this very particular genre, it has to have this perfect tempo, it has to use this particular synthesizer. Forget all of that. It's rubbish, I think, you know, because you can generate music with anything. 
it doesn't matter what genre it is, you know, you, you don't have to have the same tools as everybody else. If anything else, it's better to have different tools and use different sounds, come from a completely different angle, and then people re realise it as being unique. Um, but yeah, let's go through. I'm, I'm enjoying this, actually, just finding out what people are into. So come on, what, what, what music are you um, making? <clears throat> I'm, I'm into, like, old soul and, mm. like, hip-hop and electronic music. Um, I sing as well, so right, yeah, yeah, yeah. watching you on the loop is really cool. Thanks. Do you just, like, well, I'll give just you a go layer. in a bit, actually. Yeah, Basically, that's it, that would be really yeah. cool, just layering vocals. I improvise all of the tracks as well, so... That first track, actually, it's called Don Benito. There's a story behind that. I toured in Spain last year, um, played in a place called Don Benito. It was filmed. I improvised a track, unfortunately, it was filmed because I was able to go back and unpick it and ha um, pull it apart and then recreate it again. But the start of the loop was just uh, a noodle, and then you reverse the noodle. Everything else is going to be synced up to that noodle, you know, because it's got a start point and end point, so it will quantize the beat and all of my hardware will sink in. But that is just the bedrock for the idea. So I've got the melody and I'll have a little bit of a loop and I'll be able to add to that. So I don't know, prime example. Let's just clear this loop and I'll do another one. Um, but it works with vocals perfectly. So you can create a continuous cycle of... Let's get that a bit louder. reversed it there and that's running on its own it sounds all a bit weird but all you need to do is drop hi-hats in and I can drop the hi-hats here on the drum machine um, like this and instantly you can start to feel something there so what do you, where do you go next? I've got numerous different poly possibilities. Put a kick drum in, it's a good idea. Get the start of the beat, so. And then I can process that live vocal signal with other things that are synced in. I've got the Moogs here, which is an oscillating filter, so. And I'm still, I've not added any more to it now. So you can see the ease at which it generates your ideas. And then you can add more vocals to that. And then you can cut the first one out. So what the loop pedal allows you to do, I can only split over three channels, three loops, three tracks effectively. So again, that's a restriction. Software, you can have 100, you can have 50, you can endlessly divide it. I mean, this is working. Let's just cut that off. It's kind of working like the old tape system used to work. You know, you get old engineers that would compl complain about having to bounce everything back to the tape. There's actually a really nice process in that because once you've done it, you can't go back. So there's something about the finality of the process that's really healthy. And I think one of the problems with MIDI and software is you've got so much possibility, you don't know where to stop. So this is my way of restricting myself to be able to stop. Because there's the other thing, I don't record it. So if I improvise, the idea is kind of gone and it's lost, but I kind of like that because I know that the, the audience were in there with me, they remember it hopefully, you know, and it's like a moment in time really, it's quite special. Um, and I think that's the essence of live music. So, any more people want to sort of come? I want to know what you're all into, what, how you're making music. Go on, mate. You were saying, you were saying before that um, no set. You were saying before that your setup's never the, the same. So, yeah. say after after today when you like, unplug it all and, and take it home, you want to set it back up. Do you just? I'll just, I'm just going to put my pedals there. And well, I can set up, yeah, slightly differently. I can <laughs> take different bits of equipment. So I've got like drum pads and samplers, and sometimes I'll take a different configuration. When I work with, I work with a French band. Um, they're based in the south of France. Been working there for, with about, uh, how many years now? Five years. And I've, every time I've gone, I've gone with different equipment because it's not loop based. So I don't need the loop pedal. So I can instantly eradicate that. So I'm mostly playing guitar and singing, but I also want other sound generators or other noise generators. So I then, I've got a homemade synth, I've got like some kind of 
yeah, noise boxes, white noise generators, just really basic things that I can flick in and out because white noise, for example, on the desk, you can EQ that and I can fade that in and out and I can pan that so it can just be a burst and all I'm doing is pushing the fader up and up. Um, with the guitar, I've got a hold delay on the on the DD5, which I use quite a lot, so you pick off individual notes with that and use the desk as the interface really, as the instrument. So you can have multiple channels going in, I can be singing over the top, the band are playing and I'm just dropping in samples and bits and bobs. So for that particular project, I use less a lot of the time. Been working with Mr Scruff recently, a lot of that is kind of at home, you know, I'll be sat behind my computer, he'll send me a little sample, I'll throw a load of stuff at the sample, filter through that, pick out the ideas and send him the best bits. Other stuff will start from the ground up. So there's no fixed way of making, as you all know, I mean, you know this, don't you? Because you come up with the ideas at the wrong times. You know, you, you don't have a, you can't just sit down and make music. I think the creative process, you need to kind of eat the ideas out. And I think one of the things that I benefit from with this setup is because I enjoy it fundamentally. Like, if I could set this up at home and play for hours, I would do. You know, it's one of the best things I can think about doing. So... Because it's so much fun for me, I, I get a load out of it and the ideas come really freely and really easily. And I think that's also the essence of it. You know, if you can make music as you used to when you were a kid, don't think about it too much. Don't process your ideas too much. Obviously, use all of the skills and all of the things you're being learned and apply them. But fundamentally, when you started making music as a kid, if you ever had an instrument or if you ever got inspired by music, there was something less considered about that. And I constantly want to draw back to that point because I think the more I overthink it, the less enjoyable it is. And ultimately, that's the reason to do it. And I think that comes through as well. Um, so, yeah, I guess we've got a bit of an introduction there. You know what I'm up to and what I'm about. Um, Lucy, is there anything you wanted to bring in? I just wanted to say, um, how many people in the room play an instrument? Just so right. we know. Okay, so okay. you played an instrument first, I presume. So what's your first instrument? Mm, guitar. Okay. Same, yeah. Drums. drums and okay, interesting. Yeah, it's gonna be that, isn't it? It's gonna be drums, guitar, piano. If your family are a little bit richer, probably violin or something <laughs> like that. But <laughs> chances are they're gonna be the main instruments, you know. And I, I think the drum machines. I could probably sit you two in front of the drum machines and you understand basic processes and you'd be able to get your head around that, you know. And the guitar is the guitar ultimately. I mean, I tune the guitar differently. This is another way of me forcing different reactions and different responses. I don't know because I'm completely self-taught. All by ear, yeah. So I, I, I know that that's an E and that's an E. Yeah, it's unusual. I mean, I kind of foolishly, I think, a long time ago, I decided to continue trying to make music without having any musical theory. And I've got so far now, I don't see any point in going back, <laughs> you know. It's, I mean, there are elements, uh, particularly with the French band, they're all speaking French and talking in music, and I don't understand either. So it's really <laughs> debilitating when I'm kind of rehearsing with them and they're talking chord progressions and all of this stuff, and I've just got to literally listen like a hawk and, and wait for the changes. But that's the way I understand music best, you know, as soon as I start to kind of... Um, standardize it and give it names and titles I, it, I lose it actually it has to be a melodic thing it has to be a groove it has to be something that I can cement in my mind so um, one thing I want to uh, eventually towards the end I'd like to give people a go of my setup because I think it's quite interesting to see how other people approach it because with the same equipment everybody's going to make a different sound everybody's going to have a different reaction they're going to choose a different tempo you know a slightly different tuning or a slightly different bass note for everything. Um, and I think that's also something not to forget, you know, that we're being taught all of these standardized processes, but in reality, we're all gonna come up with a different response. So I think, yeah, it's not important or essential to have an instrument or to play an instrument because the technology that we have nowadays is so good, you know. Ultimately, I don't play an instrument. I'm just playing single notes a lot of the time, and being I'm only playing for a bar, and then I loop it. You know, <laughs> so this is that's kind of counterintuitive to the way music is usually taught. Um, I just think it's more important to be creative with the process rather than get too bogged down with the the technicalities and the theory. If you can find a process that you enjoy, 
get the most out of it and record everything. Just record all of the ideas and then reference the ideas and chances are you'll get something that's going to be useful. Um, I uh, just want uh, right, okay, yeah. I want uh, that's the gear. I want to l explain about what I do as a musician because uh, that's why I'm here. But in reality, I've worked in bars for years. I've been, you know, 19. I didn't go to university. I've kind of worked full time, continually making inroads and developments with my music. First album was 2007. Second, 2010. Since then, I've done a lot of touring. So I've been all around the world. Fortunately, I've been to I don't know America, Canada, Vietnam pretty much everywhere in Europe and been able to build audiences in loads of different places because I've fell upon my team um, by chance a lot of the time you know I because I play so many gigs people see me um, I often get a bit of look that it's the right people that see me at the right time so I played at the Philharmonic in Liverpool supporting a guy called, called Amp Fiddler that was when Andy Scruff Mr Scruff saw me play and that was 2008 so that was where the first connection was, the first conversation. We didn't talk anything musical. It was like he enjoyed the show, we introduced ourselves. And then at every interval after that, we opened up the conversation and we developed our ideas. It turned out we had very similar processes. Now I'm on his next record and I've co-written five tracks. You know, I didn't anticipate on that happening at all. Um, but it purely came from the fact that I was out there playing gigs. Um, and I think that's one of the things that is the beneficial side of doing music or trying to pursue music without the courses, without the, the grading system, is you have to get out there and meet people. Um, and that's been what's been of a benefit for me, particularly in Manchester. You're in the best city in the UK, if not Europe, if not the world for music. The more I travel, the more I realise there's something quite special here. And it's not a bias, it's... Uh, there's something very musical about the city. They did the census recently in the city. It's got more musicians than any other city in the country. Um, and that's fact. You know, there's something musical about this place. So go and speak to people. Tell them what you're into because it's not divided in genres like most other cities. People don't seem to be fixed in their one station where they go to one particular club with one particular record shop and their circle of mates. There's a lot of crossover and there's really healthy scenes all over the city. Chances are there's going to be four or five people that will link them all together. And the more you get out there, the more you get stuck into it, your opportunities will arise. So one thing that I've not had the chance to do is really kind of control the progression that I've had. You know, it's been out of my hands and it's taken a long time, I suppose. And I'm in a position now where, yeah, I'm self-employed. I don't have to work part time. I still don't earn an awful lot of money, but it is cumulative, and the more you do it, the more you earn. You know, Chances are you do get opportunities to make some big bucks in an advert or something, and that's what most people are after. But it's so few and far between. Um, the best way to make money at the moment is by playing out. Chances are that's what you're going to make your bread and butter with. And it's the same with most bands. They're not making money on uh, selling physical records. They're making money from playing big shows, creating funded projects that are going to be kind of art-based or cross-curricular or cross-medium. Um, so it's a pretty broad spectrum and I'd say try and do as much as you can because as soon as I got the opportunity I got a computer and I learned Ableton because I knew that that was going to be a tool that I'd need because I wanted to do remixes, I wanted to do film work, I wanted to do all of these things which didn't, okay they involve the hardware but you need software skills. Um, I've got enough now to be able to get me through certain processes that I've always known how to do, but you know I've now got the skill to do that. And that's allowed me to make numerous remixes. I get asked to do them every now and again and pay to do them. I've done one or two for um, Badly Drawn Boy and a couple of bands in Switzerland. Um, and in the act of doing that, it allowed me then to go in more confidently into opening a conversation with Mr. Scruff, for example and say, well, you, you send me the tracks and I can work on the software and send you something back. Um, so I've slowly accumulated all of this weirdness. <laughs> um, so, yeah, go on, there's a question. So, obviously, um, I know especially in, in what I do, I find it very, can be very difficult to actually get out to play live to people because there are that many people that are doing it. Yeah. So have you found that obviously because you've now created your own sort of style and your own, you could say niche, that it's found it 
and, and Sam, that it's, it's found it easier for you to actually get out there and more notice. Yeah, but it was hard for a long time because people looked at my beard and saw the acoustic guitar and they thought it's folk music, you know. <laughs> so I was getting put on folk shows and like blowing speakers all over the place, you know. <laughs> well, I don't know, I wouldn't go that far. But, you know, it was a very different environment to I had, you know, where I'd ever imagined going. But it was still healthy, it was still beneficial because there was always going to be people in there that got it. You know, and it generally wasn't going to be the people that were playing or promoting because it was lost on them a lot of the time. They were thinking it's folk music, it's a bit like John Martin, you know, it's, uh, no, they don't know what it is, you know, they don't know how to describe it. And that's actually been to my detriment for a long time because the industry in itself, the, the press agents, the media arms of the industry, they want it to be digestible. They want you to be able to explain it and tag your music very easily. They want it to be manageable. Um, if it's not, they don't know how to talk about it, about, or, or rob, they know how to talk about it, but it becomes an, anom an anomaly, you know, it becomes this odd thing that they can't really put a definition on. Um, that's been a problem for me up until now, but like you say, it has become this thing that's defined me, and I get booked now because of this. So I'll get booked show for shows over a, a laptop producer, you know, maybe in a similar venue, but they'll know they'll get a similar sonic range, you know, so the bigger you scale it up, the more physical it becomes, so it has that physicality of electronic music, but it's live, you know, and you're getting that extra bit of essence, you know, you're getting that extra little bit, so I suppose it was never intentional, in all honesty, um, but it has been beneficial now, and the solo side of it's been beneficial as well, you know, I never anticipated on being a solo <coughs> artist, you know, this was just a progression from the guitar, you know, I was just getting my kicks and then I realised I could play it. That's also become the element of my life, so, you know, it's like a one man trying to manage loads of gear and that's what people come and laugh at me for <laughs> <laughs> and pay good money for it. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, yeah, hopefully that's answered the question, yeah, yeah. Dennis, can I just ask, how many years ago did you start kind of the progression into hardware? First bit of gear was <coughs> 99, so we're talking first loop pedal was 2001. So, yeah, 13 years oh, looping, sorry, sorry. 32. Yeah, so it's slow progression actually. And I guess it's because I, I choose to make the mistakes live a lot of the time, I try out my new songs live. It's a bit sort of, how would you describe it? Um, I don't know, it's sadistic possibly because it, it's never quite as I want it to be and there's always room for improvement. And the, ba the, the, the reason for doing it actually is that I see the live songs, I see the songs progress and I know what works. I can see people's reactions. So if I improvise a track, something sticks in my mind, I'll go back at home and I'll try and recreate something, I'll get something that's a little bit more solidified and that will give me the opportunity to play it live. If it doesn't work, I'll scrap it. If it does work, I'll remember the bits that do and develop those and keep them and, and I alter it numerous times before I come to a, an arrangement that actually is fixed. Because I'm with this setup, it has to be generated by me and I have to be able to recreate it live. Yeah. That doesn't mean that I'm restricting myself from other projects, you know, there is a way of amalgamating my computer into this, you know, there's Firewire on the desk, I run Firewire out of the desk, I've got every, every channel being recorded, but I can run the MIDI clock from the computer. So I can have separate channels on the computer already preordained on Ableton, I can use it in the clip mode, but everything is linked in, and then I can have those channels recording back into the computer. So there's loads of things you can do. With the setup I can have Tractor running, for example, so for DJs, it's kind of interesting because you can run Tractor, you can have your sample tracks all lined up, but then you can sample bits out of them, put them into the loop pedal. Everything's quantized, don't forget. You can create a live track from that, and then you can mix back into the live track. Um, I've worked with people like Gray and Massey, you know what I mean? Gray and Massey from 808 State. Probably one of the reasons that we're all here right now, you know, is probably the granddaddy of Acid House, that brilliant guy, you know, and me and a friend jammed with him, arrived with loads of hardware, and it's literally just passing MIDI connection to each other. Once the MIDI's connected, we're all in and we can jam, you know, and it's very much like that. It's an exercise, it's a modular setup. 
And I didn't realize that until fairly recently, that this is my module, you know. It can plug into numerous different setups and I can alter it infinitely. That's why I've got all of the cables hanging off as well, so. Because it means that I can dismantle it and like you said, re-sort of jig it and have it set up in different configurations, so. Any more? Any more questions? As far as recording then, how's it trans? What's your setup as far as recording? Obviously, this is your life. This How is the you tricky thing. Yeah. Into First two albums, I decided to make studio records because I, I realised that when you're watching it unfold live, you're pretty forgiving because you can see it happening. Um, so the delays, which are really obvious, you know, basically I've got to put a loop down and wait for the next one and then wait for the next one and wait for the next one. And there's a bit of a delay before I've got the track ready to go. Um, some people get impatient with that. I'd like to think it's, I'm, I'm shortening the time because that's always one of the things that I'm working on is kind of keeping the interest there and keeping it sharp. The studio recording, I, I decided not to do that, you know, just to recreate it as it was. It would have been too sort of um, elongated, I suppose, as an album. So I added musicians, again, being in Manchester, I asked, asked a load of friends. So the likes of first album had loads of people on there. I mean, I was working at Matt and, Jed, Matt, uh, Matt and Fred's Jazz Club at the time. So I was seeing all of these jazz musicians, Luke Flowers, Steve Brown, Stuart <coughs> McCallum, loads of these great players, and I just asked them, and they said, yeah. So there's like John Thorne, who's the bass player from Lamb, um, Luke Flowers from the Cinematic Orchestra, uh, Paddy Steer, a um, guy called Henry Damasso who's a harmonica player. So I just I put everything in there. And I think I did too much, in all honesty. But it was a good learning experience because I think I had a record that I didn't really know what, I, what it wanted to be. Second record was a progression from that same idea. I expanded it even further and got really, really heavily into the sonics of the album. I wanted it to be high fidelity, you know. And I think that lost the essence of the live stuff. It lost the essence of what it was that I'm trying to do. So the next record, third album, is going to be purely live, purely me and the hardware. And how I will do that is basically feed direct outs from the desk, play it all live, use that as the reference track. But then once you've recorded all of the little nuggets that go into the loop pedal, you can loop on the software and have all of the full separation on the software and then do a mix and a master from there. So yeah, that's the next one. The one after that, I don't know. <laughs> But yeah, so each one's a learning curve, you know, each one is like a, same with every gig. And I'm never completely satisfied with what I do, and I don't imagine I ever will be, but I see that as just an opportunity to get better and improve. You know, I, I always know when I've made a mistake or something that I'm not completely satisfied with. But I think there's an advantage in putting it out, just getting the album released, putting it out there, and let other people decide, because all other people are going to pick up on different things than you will. Don't forget, you're listening to that track over and over and over again, generally. When you're sat in there and you're mixing tunes, you listen to it, what, 100 times in a day or something daft like that? You haven't got any perspective at that point. So you have to remember that as well. So let go of the track, let somebody else decide. Let go of the album, you know. Maybe let somebody else mix it, you know, if you've got bogged down with the track, pass it to somebody else and give them the responsibility to box it off because you'll feel so much better once it's done. Um, because once it's done and it's released, you can't go back and redo it. The only thing that you can do is improve on the next one. Otherwise, you end up reworking that one track forever and ever. It becomes a cyclic loop of tweaking the same idea, which is not necessarily beneficial. Um, so, yeah. Is there a philosophy behind your music? Mm. By that, I mean, like, when you're mm. starting to write a track, is there, are you always trying to put a message across? No, okay. no. It's, it's an expression of my own enjoyment, ultimately. I've got to buzz off it. If it makes me buzz, yeah, then it's all good. And that's my philosophy. It, 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 yeah, I don't know, there's lots of different ideas. As you, you've been hearing, you know, the idea of it being restricted, you know, the idea of it being hardware, I like, because sonically it is different to software. You do get advantages sonically. I've noticed when you take Hardware to like big systems, it just sounds devastating in comparison to software. I'll turn up with these little boxes and there'll be guys without Ableton and they'll blow their set apart, you know. And it's just because it's got this slightly different sonic range. Generally, systems are rigged for that kind of sound, not digital sound. Um, 
So yeah, the philosophy. I think yeah, it is. It is basically it's a it's an elemental thing for me. You know, I've got to be able to enjoy the expression of the music. It's not necessarily narrative based. I do write lyrics and I do write songs, but it's not narrative. I'm not writing stories particularly. It's words for the sound of the word. It's sentences for the melodic structure of the sentence. It's everything's kind of all encompassing really. It might even be a percussive thing for the vocals, but it's all generated on that instinctive response that I'll have. So the first single off the Mr. Scruff album was interesting because the album was finished, it was decided, release date was planned. There was one track sat around that Ninja had said that they wanted on the album. Um, I fortunately said to Andy the day before it was going to be cleared, I've got an idea, you know, I had this melody singing around my head, recorded it. I thought it was way too cheesy, I thought it was beyond belief, you know, I was reluctant to record it, but that was what ended up on the single, ended up on the track, and it's become the first single of the record, and it's been fairly well received. Um, and had I thought about that for too long, I wouldn't have put the vocal track down, and it wouldn't have been the track that it is, so, yeah, overcomping. Uh, Contemplation could be negative. Do you find, do you find that if you listen to some over, listen to something too much that you've done, that you can actually become to. I want to say hate it. It was a strong word, but yeah. to actually hate something to the point where you just don't want to use it again because you've listened to it that much. Yeah, you don't. You don't know what it is anymore. Yeah, and if you're in there, you know, if it's you, it's quite a difficult thing making music. Cause it's very, very personal. If the, if you sing as well, it's your voice. You know. Nobody likes to hear their voice, and if they do, be very wary of them. Because <laughs> it's not very easy to listen back. You know, we, we, nobody hears their talking voice in the same way. Nobody hears their singing voice in the same way. So I think, in a strange way, it is quite an uncomfortable process all of the time. And yeah, I'd, I'd be fair to say that there's loads of stuff that I've done that I really don't like, and I don't want to listen to it again, for sure. It sometimes gets thrust, but then for me, why would you sit and listen to your own music? You know, it's not for you. You know, it's it's for the people. It's kind of, it's not there to be enjoyed by you. You've got to kind of just make it, finish it, move on. You know, <laughs> sling it out there. Because yeah, there are things that I dislike. Yeah, I very rarely like discussing my set after a show because I've got nothing but bad to say even though somebody's probably eulogising it and loving it, I'm the wrong person to speak to because I can pull all of the momentum out of their, their compliment because you know, I'm, I can never be satisfied by it. But it's, it's part of the circle of creativity, I think, because you've always got room for improvement. You know, there's always somewhere else to go. There's always something else to learn. You know, there's always other people that can give you some information that you don't have. You know, and they can always come from the strangest places. So be open to the ideas and open to changing your ideas as well at somebody else's recommendation because the ego is quite a delicate thing you know and we wrap our egos up in the music somehow um, don't be disheartened by somebody not liking it you know because the chance it's somebody you know it's gonna happen you know seek out the advice from the people that you respect the opinion of so I'll always go to the same people that I trust the opinion of that I know won't pull any punches. So if I've got a track and a mix that I'm unsure about, maybe I'm satisfied with it to some extent, but I need somebody to tell me that it's good or it's not so good. Pick out those people that are not gonna, not gonna lie. If they think it's rubbish, they'll tell you it's rubbish. And you need that around you as well, I think. Um, so seek that out if you're interested in progressing, I'd, I'd say. Can you talk to us a bit about who you've collaborated with and is it a good thing? Has it been helpful for you? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, the most immediate ones sort of going back were, yeah, Mr. Scruff, the French band I've work, been working with for like five years, but they're very different to me music, musically. Um, I work with a few friends at the moment. I mean, about three, four bands, and they've all been, apart from the French project, which came about through, do you know Knitting Sawney, anybody? British bass producer, yeah, Nitin Sony. These are good things, actually. I'd recommend, right, I'll, I'll explain the project, but it was really beneficial for me. It was a funded European project. I went to Marseille. I worked with four French, four Italian, and there was four British artists. Nitin Sony is the, um, I guess he was overseeing the project. Plan was we collaborate. 
we make some tunes and then we played at a festival. The music was absolutely bloody awful <laughs> because you've got so many people with different ideas. But the beneficial side of that was meeting certain people part, that were part of the project. And I met the drummer um, who was from Marseille. He invited me to play with his band and now I'm still working with them. So that project was really not good. You know, there wasn't a great deal other than being in Marseille that was to remember, you know, musically it wasn't to my taste. I think lots of people made um, too many exceptions, you know, there wasn't a strong enough sort of idea in all of, in any of the projects. Um, but that led me to working with the French band. Um, the work that I do now in Manchester is based around a network of friends that I have, you know, and they're generally all musicians and we chat about stuff, we get together for jams, you know, and that then instigates this new project so it's become quite organic I don't often go out seeking um, collaboration necessarily it comes through people asking looking at ideas finding similar ideas and realizing that you could work together or you have some kind of synergy there doesn't always work so you know try it I get loads of loads of benefit from it because I'm generally working on my own so any chance to work in a different environment is really beneficial for me because I see how the dynamic of a band can be I see how you can sort of learn a lot from other musicians and I guess lose your ownership of the track you know you're passing the responsibility to other people if you're with people that you trust musically it's great because you know that they're going to do some of their good so you just do less and be part of something bigger, you know, there's something quite nice about that, which is contradictory to this side of <laughs> my musical output, which is me trying to do everything, you know, so that's a nice four weeks. So, yeah, the other collaborations, I mean, I'm, I'm, that's basically, they're the fundamental collaboration projects that I've been working on, but I do a lot of film stuff, um, visual work, so the visuals for the live set, I would see as a collaboration. You know, I work with visual artists and we work through ideas. They're the technicians. I've got the ideas. We bounce through the ideas. And I see that as a fundamental collaboration. Um, artwork, I've designed all of the packaging for limited, edi limited edition releases. I was collaborating with the people that were helping me use the laser cutters and all of the th tools for that. So I see everything partly as a collaboration, you know, because you have to be able to lose something and gain something at the same time you know. um, but yeah more I'd, I'd like to do more for sure have you released your album do you, um, did that come, come about as well from the network of friends that you just mentioned as well it came from somebody approaching me I've been doing gigs in Manchester for a bit the lad had set up uh, an independent label I'd had a recording sat around which was intended to be my first album um, but it wasn't quite finished I wasn't quite happy with it you know the songs I'd started writing when I was about 17 so I, I didn't even at that point I didn't have much understanding of it because I'd changed so much um, but yeah it was somebody in Manchester offered to to fund the release that then led to me um, meeting my booking agent who's based in Berlin um, and I've been working with him ever since, so that's since 2008. And that's actually been the most instrumental part. There was that initial link, so the release which led to the, the agent, the agent which, which led to the exposure, the real exposure, <coughs> which came from me playing gigs, not from the release, being in shops, not from it getting radio play, because it was such a small label. There was coverage and there was oddly um, reaction from people that I wanted to get reaction from like Madly Roots Maneuver came to see me play in London and stuff like that there was some crazy shit happening and this label you know they were nothing they were a folk label you know so it wasn't the right stable for me you know it wasn't the right environment but I got that album out and it got me to play loads and loads of shows which you know there's some mad stuff you know I've got uh, last year I got audience of like 200 in Madrid 200 in Nuremberg you know that's a lot of people <laughs> and that's only come through building this audience slowly slowly so going out and playing shows in front of 50 people and then next time you impress those 50 people and it builds and it builds and it builds you know and it's that's been how I've gone about it really um, so all of the mechanisms were there to some extent so there was distribution um, there was PR but it was really really expensive and I think a waste of money 
um, at that stage, you know. And I did have the album, so yeah, I did have a label. They approached me, um, but I was out there waiting to be approached in a way, you know. I was, my head was way above the parapet by that point, you know ready to be shot off by people that weren't into what I was doing. But that's part of it. You've got to get yourself out there to be seen. Because um, you can knock on labels' doors, but they won't speak to you unless they have a reason to speak to you. And generally, it will be through somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody that will get you a link in. I hate the saying, you know, but you know the old saying, it's who you know, not what you know. There's an, an element of both of those, because you don't meet the people that you know without knowing something. Mm -hmm. So it's... It, it's not a true saying, you know, because you only get that conversation unless you have something to reinforce it with. So a bit of knowledge, a bit of understanding about what you're doing. And then that gets you into that conversation. If you come across, you know, chances are you'll be able to work. That's the way it goes, I think. Because I don't have any other experience, I suppose. This is the way I've done it. And it seems to be beneficial for me, but it won't work for everybody. I'm pretty gregarious and I like talking so I, I um, speculate quite a lot with people and that leads to opportunities. A couple of questions asked you there. Were you ever in a band then? That's my first thing. No. No, never. Always as a solo artist. I am now, you know, it's weird how it came about. People go the other way usually. They start in bands and then they end up as a producer or end up sort of doing their own solo thing. But yeah. And then as far as your live set, are you doing a lot of bar counting? Or are you just kind of, I'm going to put the symbols in now, is it more of a feel thing? Oh, count, as yeah, in as counting in, bars now, nah, mate. In my head, it's one, 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 yeah. one, one. <laughs> That's the beat of the bar for right. me. Yeah, it's no counting. It's all intuitive, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was laughing about that last night. What tempo is that? We're, we're playing this project with my friends, and they're all musicians, proper, as I'd say, musicians. You know, they know what they're talking about. And I was saying they're yeah, counting on the one. So <laughs> it's a good way to go. <laughs> so with, so with um, when you're playing and things like that and actually thinking of the ideas in your head, yeah. do you ever struggle with like the chord repetition? Because obviously you say you're self-taught. Or do you just literally just literally gonna find how something sounds together and then at that point? Yeah, you find the thing that's there, yeah. Sometimes it's really strange how it comes about because sometimes you're literally hit something and it'll be perfectly in time, perfectly in pitch and it'll fit, you know, and it'll be that spontaneous moment that you'll kind of never forget. And that's what, there's, they, they're fleeting moments for me, you know, they're, that's what I live for is that lucidity that I'm able to just kind of hit the buttons and hit the right things at the right time. It does take a little while, but I think that's come through me just doing it over and over and over again. So when I do set up at home, I don't practice my songs. I don't play the stuff that I'll be playing live. I literally just start from scratch. Start something up, get bored of that, delete it, move on to the next one, delete it, move on to the next one. And the whole time that's happening, it speeds up my response. So my ear's getting better, you know, so I can get closer to the notes first time, but sometimes it's good to just reference in the headphones before it goes out on the speakers. So the other nice thing, I can rude solo this, check the pitching of the guitar idea, then on solo it and bring it in and put it into the loop pedal. Um, is it worth talking to you about the patching, the routing of the gear? Because it's a little bit unusual actually. I think I did mention it before, but um, there's. I use the alternative outputs of the desk, which is no usually on most desks. It's the PFL, so you'll. Are you familiar? Have you done a bit of work with live desks? Yeah, yeah. So you got your, your PFL will be sending a signal to monitors generally, is that? I guess that's what they use for a lot of the time. But because I want to record into the loop pedal, that's my send into the loop pedal. And what I've got on the desk here is the Alt 3 and 4 send, so in every channel I can raise the fade. Have you got me there? Yeah. Can't quite see there, but that's the PFL, that's my record <coughs> button. So what I'll do is I'll pick the channel that I want. So say that's, yeah, vocal mic there. I'll EQ it a little bit, so I get it a bit sharper, so it feeds back. Pan it to the right or the left. Or I can send it to effects. So I've got two loads of effects. So I can send it to delay. And then I can have that on its own channel, which is there. Click that in, that's gonna be recorded as well as the other vocal. 
but I can now EQ that and pan that if I want to. I've got another bank of effects, so I could even send that delay channel <coughs> over to the Moog, so I could go like that. Mm -hmm. And then that's coming in on this channel as well. Um, let me just put that up a little bit. Louder. So you've got three channels there, basically, that are able to be recorded from that one signal, each one doing something slightly different. Um, and then once it's in the loop pedal, it comes back into its own channel, which is its own fader strip or channel strip, which then goes to the front of the house. So it's kind of, it is actually an unusual way of using a desk, and most people don't really configure it that way. Um, I'd like more auxiliaries, I'd like more channels, but I'm restricted by the size, I'm restricted by numerous different things. I'd like limitation at certain points, you know, there's compression would be great, you know, really nice reverb. But this is the thing, you know, you start to add all of this stuff and at each stage I'm learning how to tighten my sound and make it a little bit better and improve the process. Hi. Uh, practice before each performance. No, as I said before, I, d I tend not to practice. I uh, just uh, do whatever. It just comes play. Up. Yeah. And uh, there's something else. How do you remind all these knobs and? Uh, How everything? do I remember? It comes through practicing. So oh. say I'm improvising. If I'm deep in the track, I'll generally have my eyes closed. The more I do it, the more I know where my channels are. You know, I know where the pedals are. It just becomes an intuition. Um, it becomes like the knowledge of your own instrument. You know, the it, tune you're making on a guitar, does it come when you're performing or you know what you... There are set songs, so, but then there are tracks that I will improvise. Mm -hmm. And within those set songs, it's never exactly the same. So there are things that I can add. There are different variations of arrangement. Right. Um, there's things that I can begin with that I'd never normally begin with. But generally, the chord progression will be the same. The lyrics will be the same. Um, and the general feel of the tracks will be, but there's room to play around, which is where it's really good fun. So each time you're performing something, it might be different. Yep. Any more questions? Hi. Oh, yeah. Just talk us through like what each of the boxes does. So yeah. Like, Sound-wise, right. So we've got the guitar there. So yeah, each one's got different effect sense. So right, I've got the guitar. That's going through an overdrive. So that that's the guitar sound. This is just it's just coloration really. There's not much distortion. It's a a bluesberry hot cake. <laughs> if anybody's interested, it's a b boutique pedal. I'm always looking for that weird pedal that is going to sound a little bit different to everything else so little independent companies that are making handheld pedals are always really good um, so yeah i'd recommend getting deep into them so yeah that's that's the set and then i've got i've got my delay on top of that and with that i can do all sorts of rhythm things or i could set up a track so you can go That's one way of beginning the track. So that's channel one. And again, I can go through any of the other effects. Vocal mic, which is here. Generally, when I'm playing live, I'll have an effects vocal mic, which will be this one, and then a main vocal mic, which will go to the front of house, which will be the sort of sitting on top of everything else. Channel three is the monotribe number one, which is actually going through this distortion here. I'll just drop that a little bit because it's really brutal. And that's distortion, fuzz, overdrive with a gate on there as well. So I can open up the gate um, and it becomes ridiculously frightening. Yeah, it's frightening. You imagine that loud, like really fucking loud. It's amazing. Um, but there's an AB switch on that, which means that I can control when I bring the drum machine in and out. So that was just an extra option because if you bear in mind, if I've got a track and I'm playing the guitar, it's, it's really tricky to do it with your elbows. I've tried it. So that just allows me to bring it in and out on command. Um, I was doing a bit of that before on the drum machine. But within this drum machine, you've got two splits. So you've got your 
your drums, you've got your hi-hat there, which you can hear, delete that. You've got eight steps there, and then another eight steps there. And it's the same on every drum hit, so I can cut them out. Have So we'll have a basic step there. Same with the snares, you could have them all on. Don't really want to do that. Um, so yeah, there, and then you've got your kicks, so you can activate how many steps you want as well, so you can have a three step thing if you want, you can go to one, you can do really weird shit, I mean with time signatures and stuff you can do three beats and stuff, um, right, that's on its own control, I can mute that, and then I've got a synth on the other side, which is basically a basic strip, which is my keypad. I've got VCA, VCF, LFO, cut, and a bit of option on square wave and box wave, but it's really limited. But this is synced up to the loop pedal. So that, I can record that now. And tweak it a little bit. But my other drum machine's always gonna be in. And I've got that on. So you can have them both against each other there. I can slow everything down from the master clock, which is my loop pedal as well. So I can basically slow everything. That's the control really. And that's my two channels. I've got synth on this side as well. So that's just the two drum machines running there on their own. I can then run them on their own or I can send them into the loop pedal. So I want to record the second one. That's now coming into the loop pedal. And I just press record on that, pull that back and it'll always come back in off the loop pedal then. So I'm just picking off things from the mixer and dropping them into the loop pedal and then they're always coming back. Next channels, I've got a spare one there. This one would normally be like a drum pad. I've got an SPD um, Roland drum pad, which is just for the odd drum hit here and there. Sort of pitched congas are quite nice. And um, The other effects are the Moogs. They're actually chained together, which is really bad. I'd like them on their own separate channels and stuff like that, but again, different mixer. Um, so. What the Moog, the first Moog is, a, it's an oscillating filter which is synced up via this dope for box. That's basically taking MIDI signal from the loop pedal, converting it into a sync signal which is basically a very simple CV, it's literally just your on off. That's what the drum machines are reading. But then there's a through on that which goes into the, the MIDI Murph, which means that it oscillates at the, at the same tempo. Uh, so, that's the dry signal going through the Moog. Wow, that's really bad. There we go, okay. There we go, we've got it. So that's oscillating at the same tempo as the drum machines which were... Somewhere they've gone. Um, And you can change different things on that. It's got EQ. I can open it up the envelope. I can close it on the other side. I can change the rate. It's got mids or lows. But it's always reading whatever signal I'm putting through there. So the vocal mic goes through there. And then if you think of that, you can start building up harmonies, all oscillating at different rates. So let's set something up. I'll just give you an example there. Um, so that's 120 BPM. I know that's running. Ah, oh, that's the problem. There we go. It's constantly f like firefighting this setup. Anyway, um, so. And now I've got 120 running, I've got an empty track, and I'll start with the vocal. Do you want to do the vocal? 
<coughs> Just sing a tone. Um, maybe the second verse. Okay, anybody? Okay. Anybody want to start? You got any singers? All, honestly, don't be shy. Same, but, uh, well, language. this it's, it's all the same. Music's the same language, don't forget. So now that's coming back on its own, yeah? So it can get a bit hectic, you know, I mean, that to me is, I'm not really feeling that. So if I was improvising, I'd probably delete it and start again. But once you bring the beat, it starts to make a bit more sense, you know, and then you can start to add on top of there. Um, the other effects I've got is delay, which is... Suck! So and I can control suck, suck. That's all in real time. That's not synced, so um, that I have to time. But I can time it against the drums, for example. So. There you go, yeah. So there you've got, I could just record the delay channel and flick that left to right. Uh, I'm peaking the level in there. So there you've got the delay still in the mix, it's off the desk. And then I bring that in on its own. I've got sub as well, which is basically this filter. So that's an that's just a filter on its own, which I've got the drum machine triggering into that, but can let it feed back and then it's just pure sign and it can go pretty low so you can uh, so there you got real sub there so yeah that's basically that's all I've got, you know. It does. It, it's not actually that much when you break it down, because um, all I've got is vocal mic, guitar, two drum machines, and then effects. And it's only three effects. So they're my sound sources. That's all I can use to make my tunes, you know. Um, anybody want to go? The guitar's in very unusual sing, uh, unusual singing, unusual tuning. Um, so again, that's if you can play something on that, you're in. Very different. It's uh, yeah. I don't know. That's, <laughs> don't think in chords. Don't play chords. Play notes. So, if you step up now, so you're on this channel here. Step into the space, mate. So which one is recording the guitar? That's that one there. The first one? Yeah. What I would say for the first one, don't think tempo. All oh, right. Because just it's please. already play something. Let's just delete that. Yeah. You can undo that. Let's find a fresh loop. Actually, hold on. Um. <laughs> what I would say for the first one, unless you're... The problem is if you're locking the first loop to tempo, it has to be absolutely bang on for everything else to be synced in. Right. If you choose the first loop and it's just a melody that, that sweeps, it will lock its tempo straight away. So what I would say is just play something and reverse that first one. So. 
One click is recorded, second click is to loop. It's to loop? Yeah. So that's looped there. You can undo the loop, the rev sorry, it's reversed. See the problem with this, because it's got, there'll be a stop at the beginning if you, Oh, it's actually not bad. That's pretty good. Yeah. yeah, right, okay, we're in. So you know what I mean, that's it. That's like your first loop. Can be a mistake. It can be not quite right, but that's good. I like that stop in there, you know. So now you can overdub. You can choose it on different channels. You can, yeah, go for that one. We'll send it through some delay, yeah? If I press it, it's going to record it. Yep. Find your idea first before you're ready to record. Play, play until you got your idea. You all right? Yep. Sorry, that's start. All right. recording yet. Yeah, yeah. There you go, you loop now. So you press it again. You've got that in there. And then you can... That's probably good reverse. That's the very yeah, yeah. We'll, maybe we'll bounce through because I get somebody on the drum machine in a sec. Like. Just feel free. Let's get it in. So, you're on this channel, let's just drop the level. And what you can do is select, that can be your channel, your phrase. When you're ready to record, hit that one once, and then hit it again, and then you're in. And then you can change your voice, change it. it's nice to pan one to the left and one to the right so think of your harmony line and I'll put a bit of reverb on there Sounds good, record that one. So tell me, is it true? And now you want to, you can take stuff back. Tell me, is so it true? That's just the vocal there. And then. So tell me, is it true? <laughs> it sounds good, though. <laughs> so you get the idea, you know, Tell I mean, this, me, is it true? that's a tune. Well done, thank you. Thank you, man. Tell me, is it true? So, yeah, any more questions? I think it's probably a good idea to wrap up fairly soon, because I think I've covered everything that I think I can try and explain to you. I mean... 
the reality of it is that I don't have any answers for you, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, any more questions related to the gear, you know? Or the industry, for that matter. Because in reality, I have just signed a publishing deal. I am making film music. I have done some pretty good things. So I've got a bit of experience in an area that I never thought I would be in. And I, I still am a little bit perplexed by it all. But I'm getting a load of experience, which is based around the industry. You know, there are fundamental things like the PRS, like PPL, like MCPS. All of these things are worth knowing. You know, all of the people that are gathering money on supposedly on your behalf, find out about it. You know, research what you can about every little detail regarding to <coughs> royalties and um, copyright and all of these issues. Because basically, it's your music. You've got to own it. You've got to keep it, and you've got to make money from it. So, chances are, if you're making music, somebody else will be making money out of it rather than you. So, but yeah, go on. Questions? Any? drum machines yes they are they still in like in production now and are they like ready yeah this is the new bit of gear man it's 150 quid for one of them hardly anything at all it's korg they're really good they're, they're basically building really affordable hardware which has got a load of the old circuitry that was in some of the analog gear and just making it really affordable um it's not this was just before the volca these are the monotribes but they're great I tried the bass one. In fact, Tom, you've got one of the bass ones, haven't you? Uh, I've got the drums. The drum Volker. Uh, and phenomenal. yeah, they're great bit, bits of kit. Because actually, sonically, again, when you just scale them up, they sound heavy, really heavy. Yeah, it's mad. They're light, they're battery powered, you know, great bits of kit. And I'd rather use that than an app, you know, because it's, it's the interface that's. It's a physical thing, you know, I, I can understand it, you know, I'm not going through drop down menus, you know, there's so many good apps on the iPad and the iPhone that are really powerful, but to use that live, I wouldn't want to do it, because, you know, one slip of the finger and it's all gone, you know, and okay, yeah, I slipped up before and I do a few times, but it's better to be, I, I want to interact physically with the, with the stuff, you know. So, yeah. so do you think I'm with, with those, like, I know for me, because I DJ, Live, well, I say live, not like this, but um, obviously, could you then use the the drum machines and things like that to actually build into your sets as well? Yeah. So, obviously, I know I always want to play other people's music as yeah, well yeah. as my own. So, as I was saying before, yeah, I mean, if you're DJing with the likes of Tractor or Serato, the possibilities are great for incorporating hardware because you're already running digital signal, you've already got your digital clock that you can assign any hardware to. Um, so it's a, it's a great tool for that. I can't believe that more people don't do it, to be honest. I think that's what I really want to start doing. Because it's geared for that. You know, there's loads of bits of hardware now. There's great company. I saw, like, the... Yeah, the machine stuff's brilliant. Electron, absolutely amazing. So the machine drum, the Octatrack, you know, that's as good as you're going to get hardware. You know, like, they're the, the new sort of cycle of the likes of Moog and all of the great companies that were aware of you know that everybody thinks gone by and moved now nah, look at the new stuff dave smith tempest absolutely astonishing piece of kit you know and it's it's good because it's got all of the same circuitry all of the old analog attributes i suppose sonically but it's got memory on it you know it doesn't lose its tuning it's user friendly you can plug it into software you know it's it's modern they've modernized all of the gear and i'd say yeah have a look at the new stuff before you get stuck into the old stuff because it, it gets more and more expensive the more rare it is, you know, don't you? <laughs> yeah. And there's, some, there's a lot to be said for the old classic gear because they'll never make it again. But some of the new stuff is really, really impressive. Yeah. And even the cheap, you know, like the Volker stuff is really cheap. Yeah. It's 120 quid for one of those boxes. You know, for me, that's cheap for mm. what you're getting. You know, you're getting loads of possibility there. Um, so yeah, I can't even remember what the is question there any was. Analog since you want to get your hands on? To try or own? Yeah, I want to. I, I don't have many actually. I've had access to a few good ones. Like, um, I'd probably get an ARP because I love the I idea that they like. They were in every high school in the UK. <laughs> it's true. They were every high school in the UK had ARP synths. And it was because they taught synthesis on them and then they taught music on them. So it kind of crossed two different parts of the curriculum. As soon as Yamaha got their sort of shitty keyboards on the market, they kicked out all of the 
um, ARP synths and binned a load of them. That's why they're so rare. Um, I'd like one of them. 12600 maybe. But yeah, I'm looking at modular stuff, so I'm looking at trying to build, there's uh, companies like Eurorack that you're basically building modular synthesizers. So all of the component parts that exist inside a synthesizer, but you're getting each individual box. Yeah. And then it's kind of like this, but like smaller again. Um, and the, the Kind of, yeah, but with hardware. And the advantage with all of that stuff is you can get um, modular visual hardware stuff. So it's all, it, it sounds like nothing else, basically. You can have a setup that will com be completely unique. So I like, that's what I'm drawn towards because I want something that will define my sound. Um, and I think one surefire way of doing is that is have a setup that nobody else has got, use gear that nobody else uses. Because you've either got to be the best cellist in the world or play cello like nobody else. You know, it's, that's the thing with music. You've either got to do that one thing incredibly well or do that one thing that nobody else is doing. And that's tough when you think of how much music's there and how much possibility that there is. Did you mention you built your own synth? I've built a synth, yeah, in a VHS box with the help of a friend of mine. Yeah. <laughs> it's still about, it doesn't really work at the moment, but yeah, it was ace. It's got like a PlayStation controller at the bottom which fucks it up and it's got dials on it. And yeah, It's literally just two oscillators with a blend switch in between. So it's really, really simple. Um, I don't claim to be able to build stuff, but it's something that I'd like to try and do in the future. I mean, it's great what you can get online. You can get schematics for most pedals. Like, I saw you like noticing about the pedals before, but you're probably aware that every good brand of pedal, there'll be a schematic for a, a copy, and you just buy all of the component parts on live and solder it yourself. And you've got the same thing, pretty much. But you can change one of the components and you've got a new pedal that nobody else has got. You know? So there's subtle things that you can do within that to define it as your own. Any more for any more? Quick question. Uh, so do you have any Facebook or online websites? Yeah. Yeah. Is that a small part <laughs> Yeah, the inevitable. Right. Yeah, there's stuff up there, yeah. I'm, I generally use Facebook and Instagram, actually. Right. Twitter I've got, but I just feed what I send on Instagram. Because I do a lot of traveling, I just love taking photographs. I hate telling people what I'm up to. <laughs> it really pains me, but it's essential. Um, yeah, it's easy. Do you need anyone to help you while you're working? Is that an offer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. I mean, I've, I've actually worked with my manager for years, and it's only recently that I've stopped working with him. And I was having this conversation with Lucy before, and now at a point where I've just signed a publishing deal um, on the edge of sort of a uh, maybe record deal for the next release, and I don't have a manager, and I don't know whether I need a manager. It's still a bit of an unknown because I don't know whether he can add value. Because ultimately, I've got an accountant that I pay for, a booking agent that I pay for. You know, I mean, okay, he's, he's sorting out shows, but he's taking 20%. Uh, my manager would take 20% net. You know, my accountant that I pay every year for doing my tax return. You know, but I mean, I'm doing most of the work, but he does that. So it's it becomes like a business. You know, you have to sort of structure it like that to some extent. It's better to have a, t a team of people that are doing things if you can afford it, but it costs money, you know. Yeah. And that's actually a, one of the big downsides to the industry at the moment. Okay, yeah, anybody can make music, anybody can upload it and actually make millions from it, theoretically. <laughs> but what about the people that aren't very good at social networking, you know, that aren't geared to that? You know, the, the, we're geared for different things. Our brains are wired in a very particular way. I do think the creative brain is better at being creative than it is about being logical and methodical. And in the industry, I think there's more people that are creative that are forgotten and are left out of the industry just because they can't do the social networking and the media side of things. And I think that's a real downside to the industry as we have it now. So I do think there's a place for managers. I do think there's a place for industry support, but not as it used to stand. You know, those guys used to make an awful lot of money out of the industry, and I think that's good to get rid of all of that. But I do think there's a place for it in some way. Um, so I don't know, you probably, I don't know, I don't know, as I said, I don't know what's right or wrong here. <laughs> Any more? I've got some questions. Um, Come on then. There's a sort of buzzword it seems to be talking about a lot, is limitation. Yeah. Um, 
and obviously you are limited by the hardware that you've got. And my um, own brain. If you were to just say, get a bigger desk, same mm. desk, more channels, mm. a Tempest, mm. and just kind of upscale that's what exactly you've got, what would I, you? Yeah, that's what I intend to do. Okay. And that's kind of the way I'll go about it. Is when I've got my head around that bit of equipment, you know, I, now I understand having synthesizers and drum machines in my setup, <laughs> these are the first ones. So now is the time to expand that. Kind of uh, the way I used to go was when it started to get too easy, then I'd complicate it again. So it's kind of like that with the hardware. Once I've got my head around it, then I need a new one to then misunderstand the process, learn the process, learn something new, and then move on to the next stage. So yeah, definitely new desk. It's not adequate. You know, obviously I'm now thinking about the preamps and the gain structure and stuff of the desk, all of this stuff I just wasn't aware of until I came up with these problems. Um, so it's a good way of going, actually, of working like that because you, you're learning increments, you're not learning loads at once and then going, shit, I don't need any of this. Sorry for swearing. Um, yeah, you'll have to beep that one out. So, um, it's oh, it's live, <laughs> great. Nobody's listening. Um, any more questions? It seems like you've achieved a lot so far. Is there anything at this point you could say you'd like to do? <laughs> now yeah, well, the things that I'm doing, doing now, I've always wanted to do film, um, okay. and I'm doing a film now, which I'm dead, dead happy with. It's a documentary film. It's about a photography company who are based in Berlin, in East Germany, basically. They were set up in the GDR, um, making prescribed photography for the GDR, the German De Democratic Republic, weren't able to leave the country. The wall came down. They were based in Ostkreuz, which is in Berlin, where the wall was first breached. And now they're an internationally renowned photography company, like really big deal. Um, and the documentary is about them. So it's about five photographers, the main photographers that work for the company. And its significance is this year, because it's the 25th anniversary of the wall coming down. So it's actually part of uh, the German network's package for the year of films that are going to commemorate the wall coming down and I'm doing the whole score and the credit music for that. Have you found that you might have to tweak your style a bit? Or yeah, um, a it's piano, stuff. it's piano stuff, oh. yeah. First film soundtrack I did, I just learned the piano, it's like the last six months I've taught myself how to play. How do you find the time to do that? I'm self-employed, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a musician, so I may as well do music. You know what I mean? I mean, I, every day I play. You know, I, it's I'm I'm learning that, and it was specifically so I could have tools at my disposal that when I did get those jobs through, I could write the music, and I didn't have to then go to somebody else. Can you play this for me? Can you do this for me? It was basically so I could actually do it straight away. The music's up there, you know. You just need a way to play the yeah some kind of medium and that was a new one for me so first film I did was a short and it was my ex-girlfriend's brother that made it for his degree show um, really insightful actually I really enjoyed the process because I understood why he was making the film why the cuts were where they were why he didn't over suggest certain things I understood exactly what his intentions were and hopefully the music reflects that intention of the film it won a few awards went to Am went to Amsterdam Film Festival went to Dubai I think it won Best Student Short at the Royal Television Society. So loads of accolades came from this film, and it was a student film. He was at university in Newcastle. Um, he got commissioned for his next film. Somebody saw that short that I did, and they asked me to do this documentary. So it's like, there was no money in the first thing, but it was kind of a speculative thing. I wanted to get the experience of doing film music. So there's that. I want to do computer games. I want to do a bit of sound design. Um, which I've done a little bit of, you know, for f films as well. So like generating a heartbeat, you know, thinking about that. So synthesizing a heartbeat, it's really interesting. Start to get into the anatomy of the heart because you've got to think there's like four pulses there. Do, 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 You know, and once you start to think about how sounds are constructed, that's really where I'm interested at the moment. So yeah, film, sound design. Maybe uh, electric cars was the other thought. Battery-powered cars don't have a sound. So when you're walking across the street and a battery-powered car goes past you, you're getting knocked over. So cars are going to need a sound. So <laughs> I think it'd be a wicked job just making car sounds, like futuristic car noises, and selling them to Audi. <laughs> 
But yeah, this is it, you know, there's loads of jobs in music, you know, there's loads and loads. Now, that, I bet you that's a job. There'll be somebody getting employed for Mercedes for their new electric car to make a sound. What noise would it be? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I don't know, I just want to keep on making music ultimately. I mean, yeah, I want to do stuff with sound. You know, I mean, there's sonic warfare. You know, if you're that way inclined, you can join the military and make sounds, you know, but there'll be weapons. So you know, the... Go on, go ahead. It's still good to know that people can still fall into things now. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Like nah, it's, I think it even less so now, actually. So don't be fooled by that. I think actually there's more possibility and more capability. You know, there's film competitions that are really highly renowned because the technology is good. You know, you can have an iPhone film competition and the, t the, the quality will be super high. You know, you don't need loads of money to get the tools anymore. So you can get into the industry dead quick. You can get stuff up there and get it at a high quality really fast, which was never possible before. So it opens up the platform for loads of people. Um, so, yeah. I never want to retire either, so you know. Ultimately, I see myself as continually making music, as long as I can make a little bit of money out of that, you know, enough to survive. Then I'm done. So, yeah. you, you've mentioned um, obviously Berlin quite a few times, and obviously I've got quite a lot of links in there. Mm. And I know in the electronic world that obviously Berlin's quite a massive place mm. uh, at the minute. Uh, do you find that obviously there's a lot you're getting a bit of influence from from obviously that area? in the world for obviously your electronic side of things well, and I look back to like when I first got into minimal electronics so I was getting into like glitch clicks and cuts so labels like background scape um, Rasternoten you know they're all German labels most of the guys that were making that really cold minimal electronic were coming from there so of course I, I knew about them you know um, so influenced by yeah the, the nature of the city, you know, I think Manchester makes industrial music on a whole. It's because it's an industrial city, so was Berlin. You know, it was in the East, pretty heartless place actually for a long time because it was, it was locked in the iron, you know, behind the Iron Curtain. So it's come through this renaissance um, as a city because it was inhabited by loads of free thinking people that moved there because it was dead cheap. And that's what kick-started the culture in Berlin, I think, and the electronic music culture, because it was very open-minded. It was one of the few cities that was allowed to be that way. So, yeah, fascinated by it, influenced by it, I hope. I don't know. Any more? Do you want another song? Yes, please. Okay. Um. <coughs> yeah, talking way too much, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for listening anyway, guys. I hope I've added some to the evening. I don't know. So, yeah, songs. Right. Yeah, this is one of the problems. Yeah, you have to kind of rethink every track slightly differently. <laughs>
happens with improvisation. <laughs> this doesn't often happen, believe me. I've been too busy thinking, so I've forgotten about the music side of things. <coughs> Let's try a different one. I'll do, uh, yeah, clap hands. Right, this is a, an interesting track. Right, Kim Gordon from uh, Sonic <coughs> Youth gave me this idea. I went to see uh, Kim Gordon, Jim O'Rourke at the Royal Festival Hall. She starts like sticking the jack in places and making sound. It was fucking ace. Um, <laughs> that gave me the idea for this tune, which is called Clap Hands. <coughs> no, that's not Clap Hands. Wow. The suspense. Here we go. i 
Cheers, Tom. Cheers, Lucy. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, <laughs> thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, Dennis on Twitter is Dennis with one N, Jones number one, uh, just to do a little bit of social media stuff. So, so <laughs> yeah, okay, thanks for watching. Okay. <laughs>